Thank you everybody for coming to our talk today. It's Sunday and I'm kind of amazed that you're here instead of some long brunch. <laughs> so thank you. And thank you to C Focus and STPI for inviting us to be here. So I'm going to start giving a kind of general overview of the contemporary Vietnamese art for those of you who are not so familiar with uh, the art scene in Vietnam. Hi, Phoebe. <laughs> and uh, then after that, uh, each one of our panelists will introduce what they're working on. And then we'll open and then we'll start some of the, uh, discuss some of the issues. And then hopefully we'll leave the last 15 minutes to open up to converse, uh, questions from, from the audience. So I'm going to start reading um, about uh, the development of the contemporary Vietnamese art seeing um, pretty much from the 90 to the present. But OK. Um, many of you probably know about, the Vietna about Vietnam and the Vietnam War. And due to the war, the development of Vietnamese contemporary arts was not progressing at the same pace as some of our neighbor in Southeast Asia. The Vietnam War, which also was a civil war, under the Geneva Accord, the country was divided along the 17 parallel line in 1954. And the division lasted until the end of the war in 1975. Under the communist revolutionary leader, Ho Chi Minh, Northern Vietnam became Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And until the late 80s, the official sanctioned style of art was socialist realism, uh, the st a style that idealized realistic art that was developed in the Soviet Union after World War II. Social realist, I mean, socialist realism is character characterized by the glorified depiction of communist values. Abstract art, cubism, and among every other style were banned, um, and banned all the way until the late 80s. Um, artists during that time can be reprimanded, ostracized, or even imprisoned if they work deviate, if their work is deviate from social, uh, socialist realism. While Southern Vietnam from 1954 to 1975 became the Republic of Vietnam, the visual arts in the South enjoy a more openness environment than the Hanoian artists in, uh, than the Hanoian scene. Many artists were working in abstraction, cubism. Uh, they were free to experiment with many different styles. When the Northern Communist government took, uh, won the Vietnam War and took over Southern Vietnam in 1975, the art scenes in the South come to a standstill. Some artists were sent to re-education camp, which is a labor camp, um, throughout Vietnam. Many later also escaped from Vietnam. Um, and resettle in Europe, North America, Australia. Most of their work, were, most of the work that they have done before 1975, were hidden um, in fear of the government would confiscate it. And um, many of the artwork got lost, left the country, or were destroyed. So. So the work from southern Vietnam, many of them are not, there are not many available uh, anymore. A perfect example is the artist named Ta Tay. After the war, as a former military officer in southern army, the losing side of the war, he was imprisoned from 1975 until 1981. After being released from prison, he escaped by boat. He escaped by boat from Vietnam and resettled in the, in the U.S. 
Tate returned to Vietnam shortly before he died in 2004. Today, his abstract paintings are very much sought after by Vietnamese collectors. Now, with the collapsing of the Soviet Union in the 80s, Vietnam was forced to open our door and embark on uh, economic reforms and created a socialist-oriented market economy. With the new reforms, the international community arrived and by law they have to set up offices in Hanoi. NGOs, foreign, foreigners, embassies start to nurture and support the art community in Hanoi. And in the 90s, contemporary art scene in Hanoi flourished. During this time, there was nothing happening in Saigon uh, because there was zero support from the NGO or the foreign embassies or, and also because the South was on the wrong side of the war. And so Saigon was under greater scrutiny from the gov Vietnamese communist government. And not much can be done in the cultural sector during this time. So Saigon in the 90s, in the 80s to the 90s, was, there was really kind of a, a dead zone for cultural activities. By 2000, Saigon had become the economic engine of Vietnam. In order to attract more foreign investments, the government in Saigon decided to loosen up and the sea became much more open. At some point, Saigon was actually more open than Hanoi and that allowed a lot of activities going on. And with that, with the new econo economic power, less restriction, the art scene in, in Saigon flourishes. Besides the many decorated painting galleries, there are a healthy number of contemporary art galleries in Saigon. Today, arguably, cur the current Saigon art scene is more vibrant than the Hanoi's art scene. But don't count out the Hanoi contemporary art scene yet. About three years ago, Vincom the richest and the most powerful company, Vietnamese company, decided to jump into the contemporary art game. And they opened up VCCA, or Vincom Center for Contemporary Art. Its scale and budget is unprecedented in Vietnam. The space is cavernous, it's almost a museum kind of um, space. Uh, so it's more like a Kunst Hall in Europe. They just don't have a collection. And VCCA sits inside a large shopping mall and it's surrounded by luxury high-rise residential towers. We have never seen anything like VCCA before. So far, their exhibition program is solid. But the connection between VCCA and the community, especially the art community in Hanoi, still need a lot of work. Their long-term effect on the scene has remained to be seen. We don't know how long they're going to commit to this. They might just turn that whole space into retail later on. We don't know. Uh, but right now, they're committed to being a nonprofit organization, uh, and that's say something. So they don't really sell well. That's what they say, so, but there you go. <laughs> uh, so maybe they're anticipating the, 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 the market that's coming uh, for contemporary art, or for the arts, and I think uh, that's something we will discuss later on. Uh, in, I think a lot of art spaces, both in Saigon and in Hanoi, call themselves nonprofits, but they actually all, many of them are anticipating the, the, the coming kind of art uh, um, interest in, in contemporary art. And right now, the, also the interest in just collecting art. But anyway, so, uh, so now I'm going to let each one of you talk about your projects and then we'll go into, uh, you, Twin, you want to go first? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
First of all, thank you for, very much for your attendance, and thanks STBI for you know invite, giving us an opportunity to be in here. Uh, I think first of all, I would like to uh, share with you uh, about uh, the context of uh, you know, uh, what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Um, uh, as you know, uh, Vietnam has a long history. And uh, with the population of uh, more than 90 um, million people, it's close to 100 right now, um, the, uh, the development of art and the advancement of the art uh, standard uh, in Vietnam is pretty uh, humble. So, uh, you know, being a Vietnamese, uh, we think that uh, we, has, we have the responsibility to to do something about this. So uh, moving back from the state in, 19, in 2018, we established the Nguyen Art Foundation. And our mission is simple and clear, uh, which is to support art and artists connected to Vietnam uh, in country and approach. So, uh, how we do this? It comes with the philosophy. So, uh, our philosophy of uh, collecting uh, art is um, not is the one that gives back to the artist, but not only by the traditional acquisition of the uh, artworks but also by creating uh, a sort of a platform that gives the, uh, them, uh, you know, give the artist uh, practice uh, growth and mature. Um, we dedicated to uh, the preservation of art and the development of art in Vietnam and we hope uh, we can encourage a new culture of collecting art uh, in Vietnam uh, which uh, you know prioritize the goal that foster the innovation and development of Vietnam art We, um, when we collect a, a piece of art, the, obviously there must be some parameters. Uh, we, we looked at the uh, artistic concept, the uh, practice methods, and especially the aspiration of the artist to promote our, and uh, uh, you know, put the Vietnamese art on the world map. That is the uh, very, uh, very important uh, criteria when we choose um, to collect a piece of art. Uh, not only uh, collecting art, and uh, we, um, we we mentioned earlier that we. Um, uh, create a platform uh, that you know uh, gives artists uh, opportunity to grow. How we do that? Uh, uh, first of all, I think we collaborate with uh, Sun Art, uh, led by uh, Mr. Ding Kiu and uh, Ms. Thanh Ha, uh, to create uh, a art residency uh, called A Farm. Uh, the idea of this. Uh, the arm is to uh, first to provide uh, space and funding for artists to come and produce their works and also for them to have the opportunity to uh, interact and have some sort of a cross-cultural uh, exchange. Um, and also uh, you know, many of the Vietnamese young artists, they don't have the opportunity to uh, expose to the world. 
So by uh, having uh, you know interaction with international artists uh, under the same roof for a period of time, they sort of uh, you know learn more about art from the global perspective. Uh, vice versa, uh, it gives the international artist uh, another you know dimension uh, to interact with the Vietnamese you know art uh, society uh, a very um, immersed you know uh, environment and very intimately as well um, besides we periodically we um, hold uh, collector nights which also you know uh, have the artworks of the artist are you know Mm, uh, an opportunity to sell their art and finance their, you know, uh, their work. Also, you know, give them the opportunity to to expose and make themselves known to the world as well. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, right. Okay. Yes, that is a very important thing, but uh, I, I want to save it for later. Anyway, okay. Um, we think that, you know, um, not only like collecting art or giving the environment and the, uh, the tools for the artists and the, um, the to, to grow is very important, but the more is, is more important is to uh, invest in the art education. And how we do this? Uh, fortunately, under our wing, we have uh, uh, a series of uh, uh, international school and bilingual international schools. Uh, so we sort of uh, built in the curriculum the uh, art component, which uh, you know, uh, not only give the students the, uh, the knowledge about art, uh, art appreciation, or art history, and, but also give the students the opportunity to interact and, uh, you know, with artworks and artists and uh, uh, curators, uh, uh, both from Vietnam and internationally. Uh, also, uh, we also create some uh, sort of like art gallery and art studio in uh, every uh, school campus that allows the student to actually produce their own art and also celebrate the, their work and reflect on their achievement as well. Uh, so, uh, the collections of our art uh, goes beyond the, you know, the warehouse or like uh, just our homes or somewhere. It has to be, uh, you know, share and celebrate, uh, you know, and we rotate among the school campuses for students to uh, enjoy, interact, and learn and develop from there as well. Then that's it. Thank you. Maybe you next, please. So, this next. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm a cook. I'm the director of the Cook Gallery. So, our gallery founded was founded in 2012, and uh, it's been ongoing for almost eight years. Um, the year that we were uh, found, uh, the year that was the first exhibiting uh, exhibition opening was in 2012, and that was the time when. Vietnam was in a very premature stage. Um, a lot of the galleries uh, were like not working so well, and a lot of them like were closed down. So back then, uh, when we opened the gallery, it's, um, it's a, it was a very struggling time. And fast forward up to up until now, um, the art scene has pretty much uh, changed a lot. Um, a lot of thing, a lot of the galleries are open, auction houses. Um, things are very different from the past, and um, so, and our gallery now represents um, about eight artists, 
And um, so we've been, we try to uh, introduce the Vietnamese art uh, to the public and uh, the Vietnamese audience and also the international audience. Um, hello everyone, uh, thank you for having me here. I just want to uh, remind uh, about myself that um, because um, my name is Tun Mami and I'm uh, more like an uh, like, um, interdisciplinary practitioner, like more like artist, like a, a freelance artist. But, um, um, but today I'm more talking about uh, my curatorial practice. Which um, which I don't feel really like uh, confident to talk about because uh, I never consider myself as a cu curator. But um, as Dinkula has uh, introduced in Vietnam, we have really uh, um, uh, like uh, resources for contemporary art, and also we have uh, we haven't had any support from uh, government or. Uh, any funding for the contemporary art. Even um, we have been facing with many censorship system. So in Vietnam, uh, except the like a, a lot of gallery or you know like um, um, like private co college, uh, collections, we really don't have sort of a contemporary. Uh, environments, so everything have to run underground. So who have been in charge with that? Is I think it's only artists uh, ourselves because uh, in Vietnam we don't have the contemporary uh, education. So we, uh, as an artist, uh, I have been involved with, uh, in uh, in two thousand. Uh, until 2010, I have been joined Yasan Studio, where um, it, we have been practicing uh, contemporary art ourselves uh, since 2000 and, uh, 1998. But then, uh, 2010, uh, the government forced us to close because, um, you know, uh, the communist government doesn't like. Um, uh, like sort of experimental art and doesn't doesn't like sort of uh, free uh, sp free speaking of uh, free sort of uh, voice. So 2010, we been shut down by government, and then um, actually at that moment, Hanoi really um, really had um, no contemporary art space at all. So 2012. Uh, I collaborate with uh, my colleagues called um, Hattori Hiro Uki from Japan. We uh, open um, uh, a like mobile art space called Mark Hanoi, which we like occupy the uh, uh, kitchen from Japan Foundation to run a hidden project. And in that project, we only showing or uh, only host the uh, rejected project by uh, artists and speakers from uh, uh, Vietnam or international people who come to Hanoi. So, to back to that uh, moment, as uh, Coop already said, uh, 2012 is uh, like, uh, also like, a lot of change in the art scene in Hanoi. So, we uh, I guess I remember that that years or that period, uh, the the, the sixth, like, political system quite, um, quite, quite you know quite time quite um, uh, strict. So we we actually we did some after the Nyasan studio be closed down. We still doing sort of like mobile project, but many project be rejected by government. So that's why we open sort of like hidden kitchen uh, project in very small scale, but uh, we, we run many projects which um, was impossible to do in the like in the sort of formal space. So after that, uh, we, uh, I with some other young uh, Nyasan studios uh, artists, we together 
co-founded Nyasan Collective, which we have to transform into new space and new name from Nyasan Studio. We cannot uh, um, present ourselves as uh, the formal uh, institution, so we have to establish the new space. But um, you know, really, like what uh, I would introduce uh, about Nyasan Collective as a survival mobile institution, which we always try to have a, a, a physical space, but we all always know that the space would be uh, taken away or would be shut down, shut down by government. So, in from 2013, we. We uh, run every year. We have a new space, actually. <laughs> so 2013, we established, uh, we found uh, an abandoned uh, factory in Hanoi, and then we run the Nyasan Collective very well. And the government wasn't happy; they kicked us out. And then after six months, and then we found another space in the, in the center of Hanoi, which also hidden. Uh, under the cafe, uh, uh, cafe shop, but also it be end uh, less than two years, and then we moved to another space called uh, Hanoi Creative City, uh, which also hidden in in sort of creative uh, hub, but also we only can exit there two years. So I don't know exactly the reason why the space be shut down or how. The, the people who invite us to, to uh, open the space uh, want to kick us out, but probably we, in our God shipping, we, we, we believe it's also some you know, uh, pressure from our government. They didn't want us to exit. So uh, the fact that in 2013, the uh, Hanoi Creative City kicked us out after two years, and and then we we really have no space, and we try to keep our like uh, mobile project going on. But it's quite difficult with our physical space because uh, we um, not only doing exhibit uh, exhibition, but we also try to um, gather the young uh, artists to support them to. Uh, nurture them in in the like with our workshops and also uh, uh, like practicing process. So we after 2017, we we really don't couldn't find any space. And then uh, like a, a bit of while after, I I decided to open my house to be uh, uh, you know to open a new art space, which. Uh, Luckily, I found uh, two of my friends who really support my project. So Rory uh, Gill and also another one. Uh, Rory Gill is, is uh, my collector. Also, he also really want to, uh, um, you know, uh, he was very interested in Vietnamese art. So, and another uh, friends of mine also like he's not artist also nothing related to art he in energy energy so he also want to support me to you know um, to support for the art scene so we three decided to uh, establish a new space under my house it's a very secret uh, sort of project uh, we start from May of uh, 2018, and we ran quite well. We did uh, a lot of projects with young artists. We, um, like literally, we give our space for the young artists. They could uh, practice uh, curatorial, also uh, practice uh, uh, their, um, you know, their own uh, um, practice. But then, you know, unluckily, uh, a month ago. Even we run base uh, uh, underground, the government still come to us and then try to force us to close. So, but we, we you know, like I think that is something that is not uh, new for me. So I just thought it's, an, it's, it's normal because when you live in that sort of uh, political system, you feel nothing strange, right? So the most important for 
for us have to keep survive, have to keep, uh, you know, trying to find uh, the alternative way to to create the new uh, art environment. So I think, yes, so and I will talk more if you have more questions. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, really happy to come and speak to you all. Um, so I first visited Vietnam in 2001 and have been interested in Vietnamese art since then. Um, um, for the last five years, I think, I've been working for a collector, uh, a Swiss guy who first visited uh, Vietnam in the late 80s. He was working for a cement company. Um, and obviously cement was one of those building blocks that you need when you're developing a country. And he became very interested in Vietnamese art and built a collection uh, of Andochine era and modern era paintings, uh, which he has in Switzerland. So I have been working with him on documenting the collection. I, you know, a lot of it he didn't really know who the artists were or what he had, so we really did a, a big research project for it. Um, there were a lot of conservation issues uh, with many of the pieces, especially works on paper, uh, some of the lacquer works. So we collaborated with local conservators in Zurich to find ways to sort of bring the paintings um, it stabilize them, so not restoration, but just to stabilize the paintings. And, um, and then some of them, some paintings by Niem, we thought were particularly interesting uh, and accessible as well for sort of Swiss audiences. So we had a, an exhibition and a, a talk at Hauser & Wirth Gallery in Zurich in association with Asia Society Switzerland. And we had an evening uh, of discussions and talks. And the, the head of Asia Society Switzerland did a presentation for us. Um, and Uli Sig, who is the big Chinese collector, is the, the main sort of founder of Asia Society Switzerland. So it's interesting for him as well to see um, Vietnamese art as well as Chinese art. Um, so that's sort of one project I've been working on. And uh, obviously, since working with this collection, have look, been looking around in Europe to, to locate other collections. And it's surprising how many uh, collections of um, Andochine era or modern era Vietnamese art are hiding in Europe. So there's a, 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 a few more actually in Switzerland. There's a, a really interesting collection in Sweden, another one in Holland. And, you know, they're quite private. Uh, the collectors don't necessarily want people to know what they have. But if you're a researcher, then they're quite happy to uh, show you some of the works and talk about it. So that's one thing I've been working on. And then my other sort of interest is in um, art and ecology. And I've been writing a little bit about uh, Vietnamese artists who address ecological issues. So uh, working with Mami, writing a bit with Mami, and uh, also about Udam's practice. And I'm working towards a PhD in art and ecology, um, which I started at the University of Zurich. And that's a kind of uh, a, a sort of a side hobby of mine, really. So. Um, and we've, we've been doing a lot of tracking of the, the development of the Vietnamese market and particularly in Europe and uh, following a lot of the auction sales of Vietnamese works coming through par Paris auction houses. And, it, you know, suddenly really in the last five years it's completely exploded um, and with the prices just going up and up. So it's kind of interesting to think about what the implications of that are going to be or on you know the contemporary art scene really in Vietnam so thank you thank you everybody um, so I'll, I want to go back a little bit to doing uh, point about art education um, we are as you mentioned where the population is close to a hundred thousand a hundred million uh, but the problem is we don't have that many artists. 
Um, I have been overseeing the uh, Sand Art Gallery, uh, which is a non-profit, and we want to be profit, but we're not really bad at it, so, the, so we're still non-profit. <laughs> but uh, I found that recently, in the last five years, we are competing, all the gallery are competing with each other for the same number of artists. There's about 20, 30 interesting artists in Vietnam. And the school are not producing interesting artists that are backward, that are behind the time. They basically haven't changed with the time. And so I think for me was, you know, a couple of years ago we started uh, the Sand Art Laboratory program, which is we took young artists, uh, promising young artists that come out of school and are interested in contemporary art and want to learn and want to try out new form and new methods and uh, to learn how to make work in a different way. This, the school over the years have been really, you go out there, you look for something you're interested in, you paint it and then you bring back and that's, that was pretty much the, the way. But uh, so we want to, teach them how a new way of making art by, for example, teaching them how to do um, research, for example, for their project. And so the school needs changing. And so I, I want to go to uh, Mami. Uh, you escaped, that. you came out of that system and, some, and you escaped it. You have you know, <laughs> so I, I want to hear about your experience. Um, you know, what does it mean to come out of that system? You, you, and how it affect you and how did you, you know, basically became a contemporary artist rather than a modern painter that, that they're still teaching? Um, yeah, I think, yes, yeah, that's correct that, um, you know, the, the educational system in, in Vietnam is really boring, I, 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 I have to say. Um, which really, uh, it doesn't allow uh, the uh, student to, to be creative, doesn't allow the student to think in the creative way. They only force students to follow a, a rule, which for me is terrible. If you want to be trained as an artist, when your creative mind uh, be like be you know be controlled, right? So um, you know, like the school in Vietnam is always presenting for like because it's only for example in Hanoi only one like uh, fire school like really like really limited and and the the access to that school is very limited. So it's always presenting for if you are into that school, you are the good artist. So I also believe so when I was young. So. <laughs> But when I got in, I thought it's terrible. I have so many fighting with my uh, my uh, uh, teachers because, um, you know, I couldn't uh, accept the the idea that if you you are studying in the school, you have to just be uh, practice at the uh, technical sort of uh, 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 skill. And for me, I I believe that the art have beyond the skill. The art have to be, um, you know, some. So, so how how did you escape? How did I mean? I mean, you self thought uh, in some way, but how were you able to access the information? Uh, how were you able to learn outside of the school system? So I, because I have been trained in both, uh, like uh, two art school in Hanoi, and both of them really uh, make me feel bored. So I, I really thought like it's, it's not the way I, I want to you know I, I believe that uh, I want to be so the in the the first place that I I couldn't accept that uh, the system or whatever because I didn't know any other system but I couldn't believe that I want to be like something like that right I, I don't want to be control my mind before I to be an artist so it's 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 it wrong way so so then I um, by chance, I meet people from uh, other countries, and also at that moment, at that time, I I met Nyasan Studio, which uh, is only the like um, um, like contemporary 
uh, art institution, very, very underground, but still it play very important role for lifting or, or nurturing the, the contemporary art in Vietnam. So I, I, I hang out with them. I learn a lot from the older generation. So I, from that, I, you know, I practice my, I could go along with my uh, contemporary art practice, yeah. But uh, I, I think it's the same with many contemporary artists in Vietnam that we always, like most of us, uh, except like people like, uh, like uh, Viet Kiel, like people come, from, uh, come back from uh, the West, we, the, the, the domestic artists, we are very much of self taught and we always teaching uh, by like sharing, thinking, like m very much uh, like building up the communities. Yeah. So, as Dean mentioned, that uh, in Vietnam we only have like 25 to 30 artists uh, being exposed in the international. It's True, but also not true. I, I could see, like, for example, Nha San uh, in, in the, the north, in Hanoi. Of course, it's not like, very obvious because we, we don't have uh, a gallery. We don't have a chance to show ourselves in Vietnam. Really, like, we cannot show. Or any, like, even like, last, year, last night, we have the opening in our space with um, like five, six young artists. But nobody knows because we cannot to tell people that we have the show. We only sending a private message. So actually, like for example, from last year to this year, like I could count like more than 10 young artists really start from our space and then now they already like practice quite uh, professional. So it's many, but they really have the little chance to, to present themselves. Um, okay. Maybe I'll jump into now you're talking about uh, uh, strategies. Um, I, I thought it was, uh, I always find it's interesting that Hanoi art scene always is underground and Saigon art scene is always in the open. Uh, very kind of different strategies. Um, and so, I mean, the, the underground art scene in Hanoi, as, as you heard uh, Mami talk about, almost every year they have to <laughs> move to another place or because the government is after them. Um, the Saigon art scene is quite public. Uh, we go through the process of applying for permission to do exhibitions. Uh, and of course we have trouble with that too, but uh, we also have our own strategies to deal with. So uh, I want, actually I want to ask Cook uh, as a commercial gallery, and you have done many exhibitions before, uh, how do you deal, uh, what is your strategy to deal with the, the, the cultural police? That's what they literally call cultural police. And actually there's two uh, departments that are called cultural police, the national cultural police and the city cultural police. And the national cultural police can override the city cultural police. So. <laughs> Um, so I've been doing uh, this for eight years and of course along the way uh, each exhibition we have to submit uh, permit uh, permission for exhibition and even to be here today that we have also to do the same thing uh, to take the work out and you know take, uh, get the work back um, for me it's part of my job so uh, of course, we have issues along the way. Uh, sometimes that you know, some questions got asked. Um, my feeling is that I've always, I think, because we are all in Vietnam and we are all doing our job, and we are respectful to each other. So that's the main, that's the most important thing to me. So when this kind of problem arised, uh, we like for me as a gallerist, I have to defend my artist. Um, I talk to the people in charge and you know try to explain the situation and um, what the what's the artist really talking about because sometimes uh, there will be you know misconception along the way so basically I don't think it's a strategy it's just I feel like there are a lot of misunderstandings or um, maybe you know judgments. Um, 
from both sides. So I'm, as a gallerist, kind of like a, con like a bridge to connect, you know, uh, to try to interpret um, for, you know, for the authorities to understand what is really going on. And uh, my feeling is that recently, lately, um, I think people have, a, under, have to realize that art is not just uh, something that is part of our life. Now, art is really something, is something going on, and we cannot ignore that. And I'm sure that the government is also acknowledging the, that fact. So we see um, now, you know, from, from my case, uh, I see more like tr they're trying to understand and trying to get to know more about the art, the art world, because that something is, you know, missing, you know, for a long time. Um, the censorship in Vietnam also became quite, um, uh, the, the, yeah, there's, there's a strong kind of, from the international perspective, I think there's many rumors and many misunderstanding. And uh, so I want actually, Louise, you're from outside and you've been in Vietnam quite a lot. Mm. And maybe you can address some of the misunderstanding or some of the myth about censorship in Vietnam because, you know, San Art uh, in 2013, no, no, 2016, we closed down because we were broke. And then, since then, everywhere I go, well, we reopened now, but since then, everywhere I go, people were like asking me, well, how the government shut you down? And I was like, what? Well, but I think that there's a kind of willing to believe something more sexy like censorship than something pedestrian as, you know, that we were broke and we have to shut down. So these are some of the issues yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're totally right about that. I think people like, you know, the dramatic stories. So, um, and also dramatic stories travel quickly and they travel well so uh, you know um, I was meeting with a Viet, Viet Q in London um, it must have been in October and he said to me oh have you heard a doc lab in Hanoi has just been shut down and you so that news travels quickly whereas maybe some other piece of news he wouldn't have passed on um, but then like you say you know there's two sides to that and I think a lot of people have this this view that it's uh, yeah t completely restrictive. But then it, I think maybe it, it is quite restrictive for the artists, especially in Hanoi. And I'm also interested in uh, not just the effect it has on, say, the gallery system, but on the on the artwork itself and the type of work being made and artists may be making work which are quite subtle and which can have innuendos or hidden meanings as a way to to maybe still uh, exhibit their work or make the work but not necessarily be overtly critical um so yeah, yeah. so I, I think um i think like everything uh we learned that we cannot confronted head on. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I think we all learn to be like water and you just find the cracks around <laughs> <laughs> all this and just move along that. Then we survive and we can do what we want. But so I think, again, this is why I, was th I think that we all have s our own strategies to deal with the, 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 uh, the Department of Culture and the cultural police in Vietnam. Mm, mm, um, mm. But, uh, and now, Tui and I, I actually want to ask, you're planning to insert art education into the school system, and you're planning to put some very radical work into your school. Uh, what is, what, I mean, what is your strategy for that? I'm sure you're also being watched, as a, particularly more so as an, a school than a gallery, actually. Well, I think, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, 
well, the, the general perception from, uh, you know, or from the West to Vietnam, uh, you know, being called a communist country is uh, there will be a lot of censor, and, uh, which there is. However, it's not that bad, to be honest. Um, well, uh, and sometimes it's like a cultural thing. In the U.S., we can make fun, fun of drums, we can put shit on his face and, you know, on the street, and it doesn't matter. But uh, we can't do that in Vietnam. And I don't think we, you, the Singaporean can do that with their PM as well. So, um, and this is like a, a capitalist country in Singapore now, right? So it's, it's only a cultural thing. Well, as long as we don't try to, you know, uh, overthrow the, the government, we should be good to go. So uh, I don't think, uh, you know, we have any problem and we need any strategy. Uh, what we do, uh, we really want to teach art for real, not for fake. So we want to embed art, we want to, to motivate the love for art uh, to our students by, you know, get an involved interaction with the art and the artists and the curators. Uh, get them, you know, hands-on with the, the projects in the artwork and get them, you know, have exposure to the artworks and uh, well, along the way there might be some trouble uh, you know, well, which we don't have but we may have but uh, this is part of, uh, it's part of the deal, you know, when we have the problem we, we solve it this is life uh, can I uh, can I add uh, more about this thing? Yeah. But I I think the, the um, in Vietnam is quite special uh, case in term of education and uh, a censorship because it's not like like, uh, like other like very clearly sort of uh, situation you can say in Vietnam like the the like mainstream like the school, art school, presenting for the sort of national art. So everything that we taught in school, that we accepted in the censorship system. So for example, they only teaching like modern art, like painting and sculpture, like something very like uh, mainstream, right? So every uh, department that are giving the cent, uh, license for, for art space or for event that have to go under all the, all the uh, you know, departments. So they have the painting, uh, fire art department, uh, theater department. But for, for example, of course, uh, it doesn't have trouble with you as commercial art or like collector, I don't know. But, but the fact that as I have been practicing is it's so much of trouble because, um, and then I have to be a lot of strategy because why? Because for example, they don't say that they ban performance. They don't say that they ban video. They, they don't say that they ban certain uh, uh, contemporary art practice. But the fact that you cannot get permission. And if you go to, for example, like a, a theater department to get the permission, they said, oh, your work does not belong to us. You go to the fire art. Then when you go to the fire art uh, department, they said, no, not belong to us. So it means that you don't have any way to get it. So you have to, to build sort of strictly. You have to be something that be flexible as you say, uh, go into the gap, like being semi-legal like, or the fact that they said they come to you and they said you are actually illegal. No, I mean, I, I understand the frustration. I remember uh, when we apply for video art uh, application of uh, permission to do an exhibition at San Art, and they said this is not art, this is uh, film. You have to go to Hanoi to apply for permission for this. And so we got upset, and so we came back and we translate an essay on what is video art. And so we brought it, we translate it into Vietnamese, and we brought it to the Ministry of Culture, and we said, here, this is, this is uh, an explanation that why what we're submitting is, a, is an artwork, is not a film. So they read it. And then they got back to us, and they said, uh, okay, it's video art, but 
in the future, anything longer than 15 minutes is still a film. <laughs> so, so video art in Vietnamese term is limited to 15 minutes only. Uh, and so these are some of the kind of craziness that uh, we deal with. I think every day as artists, as uh, gallerists, as you're going to be an educator in the arts. But I want to go back to some of Louise uh, talking about how the art market is so hot right now for modern Vietnamese paintings. Uh, she was talking about how uh, a, an artwork that was prized for, uh, listed in auction uh, estimate for 30 thousand and can go up to two hundred thousand and that's a little that's really crazy um, and I was just talking to uh, a private dealer in Saigon and she said she has so many collector that are waiting for a uh, to buy paintings from her for modern paintings praying price range from 50 to 100,000 and she doesn't have material to sell it to them because there are not many out there and so this is uh, and so I'm kind of curious when is this interest in you know the modern painting will translate it and yeah. migrate it over to the contemporary art uh, because we yeah. need the we need that we need that interest. Yeah, it's um, I I think uh, you know if you look at the auctions that have been in Paris over the last sort of five years. So I'm looking here at a new and Nam Song piece, uh, estimate fifty to eighty thousand, and it sold for five hundred and sixty-five thousand euros. You know, so it could just completely crazy prices and I think some of the, the, the discrepancy is maybe because it was it's relatively new so the auction houses don't know necessarily what estimate to put on the work but nevertheless you know five, over 500,000 for such a painting is really a lot of money and you go to the auction houses and there are um, you know, groups of people flying over from Vietnam or often on the phone bidding on behalf of other people. And, uh, but, and then also a lot of online um, bidders as well. So bet between uh, all of this activity, the prices are going higher and higher. And certainly um, over the last five years, the quality and of the work being auctioned is not necessarily getting better because a lot of, like you say, there's a scarcity now and a lot of the really great pieces maybe have already been to sale. And so sometimes you see, um, you know, recently there was a lack of work. I can't remember who it was by, but the, the quality, the condition was very bad. It was cracked. It was not in good condition at all. But nevertheless, people were still uh, really wanting to buy these pieces because there's sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the supply is, is maybe dwindling a little bit, certainly in Europe. And, and most of the pieces are bought by Vietnamese and, and taken back to uh, Vietnam. And um, so I, I, I kind of wonder if, you know, the way the art market develops is, you know, there's a big interest in one thing. When that starts to run out, the auction houses or the dealers start to put other things in. And now we see this, this second generation uh, becoming even more desirable. And, and, you know, maybe it develops like that and then we get to the contemporary. But the question is how long? How, you know, so I, I think some people I'm talking to are thinking, okay, so this real sort of um, works from, say, the, the 80s and the 90s, they think in the next three years, that's going to really pop, but, and then maybe contemporary after, but, but, but internationally now, contemporary is just so um, important and desirable, so y you don't, we don't really know about that, and um, yeah. So, maybe Cook? Since you have you seen that interest translate from the modern paintings to contemporary art? Uh, yes, of course. Like uh, my own collectors, like they they started um, they see the 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 change. Like people are you know uh, aggressively buying the modern ones. So now you know for the like the late starters, they cannot you know catch up with that. 
So what they do is that they look for, you know, the more recent ones, the more contemporary, more, you know, later on in the modern eras. So that's what's happening. Like, you know, um, I can see that some collect some there's some waves that they are doing that now. But you, th I mean, many of them don't know much about contemporary art. Uh, we don't have art advisor, we don't have a good system that educate these people. Uh, I mean, are you doing any of that kind of program where you educate the collectors so they, they understand what they're buying rather than they, then they feel like, oh God, I'm behind now, I just buy whatever is throwing at me. <laughs> no, actually, I think uh, what's happening is that they they learn quite quickly. Um, so they've been going to, you know, of course, like for me, I will advise them, you know, to go to see a lot of, uh, like for the summertime, go see different museum shows. They can go to Singapore very quick um, and, you know, uh, intensively, you know, learning. And um, so that's, uh, that's happening and also, um, a lot of them, they are, re like they love art. I know that it's not, at least for my case, a lot of them, they are, they are into art, not just because of the investment itself, not, of the, not because of the monetary values, but it's start, they start with, you know, uh, the passion for it. And along the way, they grow into it. You know, I always tell them, like, art is, like, very addictive. Once you step in, it's really difficult to step out. So, you know, it just grows into you. Um, so that's... And I think the last question I'm going to leave for uh, Twin. You and your wife are very adventurous in buying contemporary Vietnamese art. I mean, their work that uh, even my young curator, they were like, what? They bought that? <laughs> because, like for an example, a, a piece that we showed to you uh, about three, four months ago, is a jacket hanging upside down on the, in the ceiling and it's filled with sand and just dripping with sand, uh, the sand is dripped down and his wife came in and fell in love with it and bought it and, and we, we never thought we would sell out work but it was a beautiful work and we love it and they bought, uh, his wife bought it and so I, I kind of want to hear from you and, well, your wife too, what make you have this, I mean, courage or belief that you're like buying things that everybody now want oil paint and to hang on their wall and you're just buying things that uh, is not what everybody expect, uh, you know, a collector would buy. Well, yeah, I think it, it's all have to come down to, you know, first about our philosophy and our parameters when we collect a piece of art. Um, most of uh, the, you know, collectors in Vietnam especially uh, are looking at the uh, financial incentive of the investment, while, uh, sadly, which is the case, while uh, our parameter is to, uh, you know, uh, to foster the uh, innovation of art in Vietnam. So um, we sort of uh, want to encourage uh, people who, uh, who dare to change, who, you know, who, who really uh, think outside the box so, um, and uh, do something new. That is uh, our criteria, uh, which may not make any financial year or something, and that is never in our equation uh, in the first place when we collect art. Because if there were any financial, you know, uh, uh, expectation, I mean, um, uh, uh, financial, you know, um, projection about the, the investment of art that might uh, turn me off and I would never be an art collector. Well, thank you everybody. So now we're going to open up to the audience. Uh, so if you have any questions. Uh,
Thank you for those very interesting presentations. I had a question I, I think is more for Ding and for Mami, and it's about um, the practice that you've built very successfully has been working totally independently from any kind of state support. So I think it's so challenging for an artist to not be able to, for example, have the support of a contemporary art museum or a kind of cultural institution within Vietnam. And I guess even though those institutions exist, historically they've never worked effectively with experimental artists. So what I wanted to ask, um, do you foresee that changing or have there been any examples where experimental art or models where experimental artists have been able to engage with successfully with state institutions like museums, state-funded museums or state-funded universities or cultural institutes. I mean, is, is there a way forward in that path? Or for you, is that just off the table? You, you perceive that you have to just continue to find completely independent source of or means of working. Um, thank you for the question. I think I, I have the belief of uh, like it will move toward to have a better sort of um, uh, uh, the art scene in Vietnam. But I also I also think that it it need a lot of time and within this sort of political system it's just really difficult. So that's why we um, you know in order to move it towards we. We want to um, to go around, not uh, go straight to to talk or, or to confront with the uh, the university or with the government. We we have been uh, working a lot with the young people, so we create sort of young uh, art uh, young art study, like young art uh, practitioner. So we also work with media young media so everything we try to connect to the young generation which uh, we we believe that in in the shorter future they will uh, you know support us or also they could Im like Im impact to the um, the system so that I think this is a way we, we could work it out um, yeah if people understand the contemporary art uh, young people, uh, they they will become you know leading the, the the country. So they will make the change. I believe. So yeah, we need to wait. Uh, I I agree with Mami. Uh, and at San Art over the years that we that's what we have trying to do is uh, we will, we have the lab program which is basically teaching promising art is a new way of working, a new way of thinking about contemporary art, and we hope that we will insert them back into this, uh, the education system, and they will become teachers, and, and uh, you know, change the school system from the inside. So that, that was uh, the lab system, and we have my one of the very good artists from Hue, that she ended up back teaching at the school system, and, and uh, art school in, in Hue, but sadly, Hue school just closed their art department program, so, and it was one of the most promising program to progressive program. And so, but we hope, you know, the, the generation, the younger generation that we're working with will go, will be higher eventually to the university, the art university in Vietnam. And secondly, the curators that we're working, the young curators that we're working now, and that's what, what we hope to happen. They will eventually be hired by whether by the Ministry of Culture or the Fine Art Museums, because eventually these are the only kids in the country that know how to curate, how to run a cultural institution. And that will happen, but it will take time. And that, so that's what we're doing now. We're building that kind of foundation. And in order, if eventually our young curator will go into the institution and change it. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very enlightening uh, discussion. I learned a lot. Uh, I have a few questions. First, maybe to uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Nguyen, is it? Yeah. Okay. 
I, I, I googled your, your foundation. Uh, you have a very interesting collection. Uh, my question is that, uh, where do you put these, these works? Are they uh, available for uh, members of the public to come to, to view the collection? Or they are all, or they're all kept in storage or in your schools? And we need special uh, appointment to, to see uh, your collection. Uh, you, and you also mentioned just now about, uh, you know, that, that you know, this is a difficult art and it's not investment. Uh, uh, quite unlikely that, you know, or you wait a long time before anybody see value in them. Uh, I take a different view. Uh, because like, look at someone like uh, Ulysses. He went to China. He collected contemporary art. People laugh at him. And today, no one's laughing. He's like, he's the last laugh. So I would say that uh, why should not view it this way? Not to, not to say that, that, he, that he bought to make money. What I'm saying is that uh, there is a future of contemporary art. I, I'm not so pessimistic. But it's going to take a long time. Because related to this is this question of uh, the rise of modern art, uh, rise of modern Vietnamese art at, at auctions, high prices. Uh. But this, this trend is, is not unusual uh, in our part of the world. Because if you look at China, you look at uh, Singapore even, you know, you know, they all, the, the rich people always go to the, the, the modern masters first because they're accessible, easy to hang out, you know, pretty, you know, you know nobody takes objection. Uh, and of course, uh, also this uh, trend of what we call the Nova Rich are coming out uh, because they have enough of sports car, mistresses, you know, aeroplane, whatever. They come to modern art. And, and for some of them, it's uh, just simply trophies. Uh, and again, I'm not pessimistic. Because I think that there's a future for contemporary art. It may take a longer time. Uh, I think the problem for modern Vietnamese art is that there are a lot of fakes around. And eventually, when there's so much fakes, you know, then they will, they will be more careful and, and they say, maybe I should buy the living artist. So I, I tend to be an uh, optimist. So, Kyule, uh, don't worry. Uh, uh, it will come. It will come. Huh? Uh, my third uh, comment is uh, about censorship. Censorship is a very sensitive subject, not only in Vietnam, I think in China. Uh, I think in our part of Asia, uh, this is a, quite a common thing. Most states have a censorship. Uh, simply because the, 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 the ruling party uh, wants to retain political control. And, and if they give you uh, too much freedom to think and to express, then you know, that can lead to other kind of problems. Then the, the, the populism will make uh, other demands. Uh, I wonder when we talk about state censorship, uh, is that the issue of a self-censorship? Whether artists after a while as a strategy decide that, okay, Maybe on this, I'm not going to get away. Maybe I should be a bit cleverer. On this, I, I don't touch. But I, I can touch other things. I try to push the boundary slowly, slowly. I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether some artists practice that. Uh, and finally, I have a question for Ms. Malcolm. Uh, uh, I, I heard you mention that you work with a Swiss collection. Uh, where is this collection located? Is it in Ho Chi Minh or is it overseas? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, the collection in Switzerland is in a home or in a, cu in a couple of homes, also in a warehouse, um, which is why I try to persuade the collector to at least do uh, one event, you know, with Asia Society Switzerland, so at least some people can see them. And um, the collection, there's another collection in uh, London. Uh, I know a lady there who is really a big lacquer collector. Uh, she's a French lady, and uh, her collection is really throughout her house. You walk into her home, and it's just really unbelievable. Every single wall or space is uh, hung with the Vietnamese artwork, and um, probably 80% of them are uh, lacquer uh, pieces. Uh, so yeah, in people's homes, warehouses, but not not accessible really, which I think is really sad. Um, but yeah. Uh, you want to talk about where? Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Thanks for your question. Um, first of all, yeah. Now we we um, have collected quite a few pieces of art, and uh, uh, quite a few of them still in the storage, uh, but. Uh, the plan is uh, finally they and shortly they will have to be displayed, uh, you know, in uh, all of our school campuses, because uh, we just launched two new schools and we need to like you know uh, stabilize it, and uh, I think within a couple of months we will have all of our art. I mean, that's the whole idea. The art that we collect has to be displayed and interacted uh, with our students and the communities. 
uh, that's your first question. Another question is about the, uh, you know, the speculation of, uh, you know, uh, the values of uh, our art collections uh, in the future. Well, yeah, I don't want to be pessimistic, uh, but I know, I know the optimistic is, may not be, you know, uh, practical. So I don't want to care about that. Uh, this is true, this is true, because, um, you know, um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the mission of our collection is to help art and artists connected to Vietnam. And, you know, uh, at the end of the day, we would like to, uh, you know, to bring the Vietnam's art uh, on the world map which is now very humble. We have a few, like uh, Ding Kiu Le, he, he's, he's done very, very well. But we want to clone like hundreds of Le. Not clone. I mean, I mean, not clone, I mean, like, of course. I mean, we want, we want to encourage like, you know, more, more Le, not only just this one. So uh, by doing so, if we don't, you know, help the young, uh, you know, new artists, the opportunities, uh, we never get there. Uh, somebody has have to make a start. Ha, ha, somebody have to jump out, you know, and mm, drive forward. So uh, that's the, the the you know the second question. And luckily, we uh, we have some other financial arms that can f sort of like feed this. So uh, we should be good for a longer time. We hope. Uh, yes. Thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, Tuan. Uh, Mommy, you want to talk about self-censorship and... Uh, yes, I think that is a really uh, a matter for the art and also especially in the context of uh, Southeast Asia or in Vietnam. It's, uh, for me, it's really dangerous uh, for the art scene and I, I, would, I could see it uh, from, you know, so, like uh, around. But uh, that's why I think, uh, I believe that we, in order to, to fix the problem, you couldn't fight with the, the, the government or couldn't fight the bigger power. So um, I believe that if you can find another way, alternative way to give them, the young artists or the artists, more it's like healthy environment, then, then they could be honest with themselves or they could you know, uh, get away from the self-censorship. I really worry, like, believe that if you really don't give them the environment, they will dry up, right? So, for example, uh, our uh, space, our art space, we always, uh, when we work with artists, especially we work mostly with young artists, we give them space and then that sometimes like, the artist comes and says, what can we do, right? With the space, what can we do that or do this? I said, we trust you, right? So you have to be free as like whatever you believe and even you want to burn the hole, you can burn the hole, but if you can, re you, you have to rebuild it. So it's no limitation. So I believe that sort of environment could Keep them the uh, you know, encourage them to be themselves to be uh, like get away of the fears or man, any fears. So that why so also I think that in order to do it you have to be sort of not self censor even as the aspect, but you have to be more smart or be s like quite sneaky to to make it happen. I don't you know I don't see that you know being uh, getting, uh, finding the way to realize what you believe is, is the self censor but it's the way to be more creative, to make it happen. So. Oh, you want to say something? Okay. I have a question for Mami, actually. And also, one thing I wanted to say is, you know the new um, American University is going to be opening in Ho Chi Minh City? Yes. And, do, and f for arts and you know, what difference do you think maybe that might make and, uh, in terms of uh, educate? You well, know, the it Fulbright was, University, yeah, you mean. Yeah. And it's a really interesting uh, project. Mm. You know where that money, well, they don't have money, by the way. Oh, they don't have money, yeah. But originally, this is, uh, I'll do quickly, I know we're, we're over our time. Uh, but um, 
after the, the war, when the war ended in 1975, there was something like a hundred million uh, uh, dollars of southern Vietnamese money sitting in a bank in America. And so it was on hold, or was frozen by the American government. And, uh, and then when the uh, normalized relation between Vietnam and, and America happened, they start to slowly release that money, but they don't want to give that money to uh, Vietnam. So they start to do uh, support, you know, uh, projects, uh, not, um, independent projects in Vietnam through that money. But pretty much by now, it's, the money is almost gone. And so they are now want to open the school. Uh, so there's not much money left. So now actually they're raising money from Vietnamese <laughs> people to open the school. Now on one hand it's good, but on the other hand, there's a lot of issues. Why is this school called the Fulbright, which Madame Nguyen is, is uh, raising the question, why? Because it's not American money. The whole school is Vietnamese money. And now it's using the name of the Fulbright, which is like a former senator uh, in America who started the Fulbright Fellowship Program in America. So she had a very valid question. And also it's running, now I think it's run by a Vietnamese CEO yeah. now, but before it wasn't run by a Vietnamese CEO. And uh, I have been contacted by them, but it's all in there, nothing is fixed. Mm. And right now I think they have like 10 students. Y yeah. 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 And so I'm, I'm just standing back and just watch because I think it's so problematic on yeah. some level. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one question to Mami? I wanted to ask you, because um, my research now is about Anthropocene, and in your talk yesterday, you were talking about how you had to kind of break in somehow to different sites to make your work, and obviously it's not necessarily like a censored, but it's difficult, and I just wondered how you, uh, you know, addressing these sort of quite political, difficult environmental issues and communicating them and um, avoiding any government issues uh, surrounding it, you know? So obviously if you're kind of breaking into the sites and... Uh, I think, uh, you know, as a work artist working in Vietnam, you have, have to be like sort of sensitive, like have to be more careful, but I, I believe that there are way uh, that relates to sort of like uh, your question about uh, cell sensors. So how could we do what we believe it should be without any fear or without uh, danger? danger. So, but for me, the project you mentioned that um, I think first of all, you have to really be honest with yourself. And I don't think there's any other um, issue that you should to address on your work. I, as I believe. So, the, back to that project, I think, um, yes, um, I'm using sort of also building my strategy to, 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 to talk about the political sort of situation to critique it, but, uh, but the fact the project is very, very sort of, um, I mean, for me as an artist, I f I'm facing with the research uh, social um, sort of uh, matter as um, an observer, and I felt that myself is really weak, and I fail as a, a, a person, uh, or as a, um, you know, first of all, as a person, I felt like I couldn't do anything. I, I fell in the system, so the whole system is over you, and you you lost in the the whole contact of the mass production, mass uh, um, control. So, so you know, uh, I I thought that I shouldn't do any art because uh, what? Why you do need to do art when you can, could not contribute anything to the society or whatever? But and then uh, later on, I found that it's still important to talk about the you know the voice of loser. Why you don't talk as the loser? And then 
you know, let people see you as a loser. Why not? And then it's also the way to critique the system. And I believe uh, that that my way, you know, it's not about a self censor, but it's also be honest to 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 you know to to talk about the matter in the way that you can critique, but it's soft critique. I think we're running out of time. So thank you everybody for participating panels. And I think, I hope you guys are gonna hang around. If you guys have any questions, just grab them and ask them. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. Thank you.